Good evening, church. Good to see everyone out this evening. I hope that you had a very pleasant afternoon. Uh, you know, if, if trees and everything weren't blowing around too much in your yard, it was really a nice day for a nap too, wasn't it? Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. And now we can be with God's people and have this Bible class hour together. I want to welcome you to our Bible class hour here at Livingston. Of course, for the younger people, that's uh, grades five on down. We're having our Bible classes as per usual. But here in the month of April, uh, we are combining our adult Bible classes along with the junior high classes and the senior high classes for a special series, Wonderfully Made, Evidences of God's Design. And so Sunday nights and Wednesday nights in the month of April, we're having guest speakers talking about wonderful evidences uh, which encourage us in the truth of God's account of creation, the inspiration of the Word of God, and understanding that this is truly our Father's world. Tonight our series continues with Brother Todd Chandler speaking to us on the biologist's new clothes. Uh, I'm a title guy, and so I was all about that title. I can't wait to hear what Brother Todd has to share with us. In just a moment, we're going to invite Brother Grant Goad to come to the microphone and lead us in a word of prayer. And then Brother Todd will have the rest of the time to um, bring the lesson. Since this is Bible classes, there will be bells ringing. Uh, two bells, uh, whether you're done talking or not, Todd, they're going to ring the bells. And so if parents need to go and get, get their kids, of course, that's fine. Uh, and then at the end of the time, Brother Todd will lead us in a word of prayer. And that will be our dismissal prayer. That will end our session and our time together this evening. I was reflecting this afternoon. Uh, Brother Edwin had a fine lesson this morning about... Uh, really our blessings and being wise stewards of those things. I'm so thankful for the deacons we have in this congregation. Amen? I'll tell you what, they've just been shining uh, in so many different roles and activities here lately, but I was impressed with them again. The work day that was organized yesterday, even the way that several of them sprung into action uh, around 11.30 this morning when the power went out here, uh, and uh, we had to figure out a plan for safety and uh, peace, and they just led us through all that. Many, many fine deacons here, and we are blessed to have them. Uh, so be sure and thank a deacon tonight. Well, there's a number in our congregation that we want to be mindful of in our prayers. Brother Steve Welch, as he continues his fight against COVID, other members with COVID as well. We want to remember the Blaylock family uh, and, and uh, upcoming diagnosis with Sister Blaylock. And, uh, and uh, so several that we want to keep in our prayers. So we're going to have prayer now. Brother Grant Goad's going to lead us. Oh, one more thing I'm supposed to remind us of. Um, tonight we are, for the members, tonight we are, it's the last night for that survey uh, about uh, assembling and times and all of that. You would have gotten email about that. If you haven't done that and turned that into the elders, please do that tonight. The deadline is tonight. That's, that's I need to remember that. Okay, let's uh, bow and have a word of prayer. Brother Grant. Let's pray together. God, we thank you for this great day, Lord. It is a great day to be together, uh, together at this, uh, this building with this church to dive into some topics that honestly can be uh, troubling at times, can be difficult at times to understand. Lord, we thank you so much for uh, brothers like Todd and others who will be leading the series, who have spent the time and the hours preparing and studying these topics. Um, that are difficult for some of us to understand, like myself, but we thank you for them and their courage to do so in a world that uh, is completely preaching against it, Lord. We thank you so much for the elders, the deacons, who are putting these topics before us so we can go out to the world and share it uh, just a little bit to those around us, to our friends and neighbors. Lord, we thank you for the rain that you've provided. Keep everyone safe. Continue to keep everyone safe through it, uh, but we do thank you for it. It's just a small glimpse of your majesty that we can see uh, here in Florida on a, on a daily basis, Lord, and we love that. Lord, continue to be with our hearts and minds as we uh, study your word tonight and dive into these topics. We love you, Father. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen. Good evening. It is good to be with you. We missed the electrical fun this morning. Uh, we made a very quick trip up to Alabama yesterday. We were on the road today. Our oldest, who many of you know, proposed to his girlfriend last night, which was very exciting. So we booked it up, celebrated, and booked it back. So on the road, I got a text, hey, can you do Zoom? I thought, oh, I do not want to do Zoom. <laughs> do not want to do Zoom. Then a 
few minutes later, another text saying, hey, the lights are on. So I'm very glad that we're able to be together this evening to discuss this question or this subject, the biologist's new clothes. Nathan Ward got us started and Andrew continued with a rather lame joke to start. <laughs> I was going to try to continue that. I was going to try to continue that, but decided bio- biologists had just grown too much culture to get into that. So we will just skip that all together <laughs> and just move forward into the good things. Good things. Turn with me to 1 John, please. The book of 1 John. <clears throat> it's a good question, what's a biologist? I always tell people, it's what cool people do. <laughs> and you see some of the key words up here. They teach, experiment, discover, sample, explore, share, all those kinds of great words for biology. But what really is the foundation of the discipline of biology, and I'll use biology as the representation for all natural science, because I think it's fair to do that, because the foundation for all natural science is basically the same today, and it is important for us to understand that, as it is important for a student or a teacher of biology to understand that, and it actually has some parallels to the, to the epistle of 1 John. 1 John was written to Christians influenced by a worldview. How do you view the world? And as a worldview known as Gnosticism, you may have heard that term before, and essentially split the physical and spiritual nature of people. We all have a physical and a spiritual nature. The Bible teaches that. What the Bible teaches very clearly, though, is that the spiritual and physical nature are very much unified. They are to be unified, and that they are, in fact. And with the worldview, the was influencing some of the Christians in the first century taught was that yes there's a spiritual and a physical worldview but they are separate from each other there is a dualism but they are separated and what happens in the spiritual realm really doesn't have a whole lot to do with what's going on in the physical realm and there were lots of implications then conclusions that came from that one of those was sin doesn't really matter because there's the spiritual you the real you then there's the physical you which isn't really connected to the real you. So what you do in your body can be disconnected from who you really are. Your body can be disconnected from who you really are. Does that sound familiar? Not because you've studied first century, but because you're living in the 21st century? There's lots of parallels to that in our century. And so John writes, and very quickly addresses this idea that what one does with the body cannot be disconnected from who one is spiritually. So take a look at chapter 1 and verse 6. If we say we have fellowship with him, there's a spiritual, right? We have fellowship with the spiritual being, with God. That's where our relationship lies. And we walk in darkness, there's the physical, what I'm doing. So if we say a spirit, make a spiritual claim, but we physically work in a different way, we lie and do not practice the truth. So what he's reminding them, it's getting teaching them here at the very beginning is the spiritual relationship with God can't be divorced from my actions. They have to go together. They do go together. And then chapter 1 and verse 7, if we walk in the light, physical, as he is in the light, there's a spiritual relationship, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. So actions that are concordant or congruent with a spiritual claim, a spiritual reality if you're a Christian, a relationship with God, then that brings those two natures into unity. And that's what God intends. My physical walk properly reflects my spiritual relationship. And I can't separate those things from each other. And this gospel spends a lot of time emphasizing that point, that who I am physically reflects my spiritual relationships. And so we can walk through this together and see that my worldview is going to be reflected in my actions, whether that's the Gnosticism of the first century that leads to actions, or it's what's called today, among other things, postmodernism, which has shares many of the same claims, that who I really am can be separated from what I am physically. And that's, if I believe that, that's going to play out in behavior. And actions. Continue reading in 1 John to see this is more than just an academic issue. Chapter 1 and verse 8. We'll just take a a sample of a few verses here. 
If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If I think I can divorce my actions from my spiritual relationship, he said, you are deceived. Something has deceived you. The biologist, perhaps, is wearing new clothes. My little children, chapter 2 and verse 1. My little children, I write these things so that you may not sin, because sin matters. That's what he's getting at. Verse 3 of chapter 2. Now by this, we know that we know him, if we keep his commandments. So how do I know spiritually that I know who the Lord is? Because of what I do. I keep his commandments. The spiritual and the physical are congruent with each other. Or chapter 2 and verse 5. But whoever keeps his word, truly the love of God is perfected in him. By this we know that we are in him. Chapter 2 and verse 29 of 1 John. If you know that he is righteous, you know that everyone who practices righteousness is born of him. How do I know I'm born of him? Because it's what I do. My spiritual relationship is evident by what I do. And then finally one more, chapter 3 and verse 7. Little children, let no one deceive you. Deception again, you notice that? Let no one deceive you. He who practices righteousness is righteous, just as he is righteous. So John spends a lot of time in this book emphasizing the relationship between who I really am and my physical life, the spiritual and physical duality that we all have. They, they are inseparable from each, from each other. And he did that because there is a worldview that if you accept it, leads to consequences down the road, many of them, one of which is a life of sin. And then that's a threat to who I am spiritually. Jesus taught the same thing. In John chapter 14 and verse 15, if you love me, you know this verse, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. That's what he said. You really will have a spiritual relationship with me? Then you will do what I tell you. The physical and the spiritual have to be congruent with each other. And so postmodernism in our world is a form of dualism. There is a physical and a spiritual, or they wouldn't say spiritual perhaps, but a mind nature. They might use the word spiritual, but not probably as the Bible uses. But there's who I am, then there's who I am in my mind or in my heart. We hear that language all the time in our culture. That there's this sort of two parts to us. And postmodernism separates the physical from whom I really am. And it also leads me to a position of moral relativism, where there is no right, there is no wrong, that my truth is individual to me. I make my own truth. In fact, everybody makes their own truth. You make yours because you have one unique set of experiences. I have a different set of experiences, so my truth is going to be different than yours. And what you tell me is true is true because of what you've experienced. And you've had all these pieces of life experience, other people talking to you, and, and you've built your form of truth. Well, I've had different pieces, and I can build mine. And if you give me yours, well, yours was just pieced together. You, you constructed it. I can deconstruct that. I'm allowed to take those pieces apart, and then I build what I think truth ought to be. And that's very much a worldview of our time. That may be language you're familiar with, maybe language you're not familiar with, but in the academic world, and by the way, philosophy is not my niche of academia, but that's where, they're, that's, that's where that comes from. And it's all over the place, all over the place, that you can deconstruct what someone tells you and construct what you think ought to be reality. This isn't the point of this talk, but it's even gotten to the point of biology, hasn't it? You can now actually deconstruct who you are biologically, you can, that's the claim, and construct yourself into somebody else, somebody different, if that is your, your version of truth. So postmodernism is the worldview of our time, very similar to Gnosticism in the first century, where reality is inherently subjective. That's what postmodernism will tell us, that reality is fundamentally subjective and for the reason I just described because you build your own and I build my own reality and postmodernism then is relativistic everything is relative what's moral what is right what's a family what's fair what is just what and on it goes everything is relative and so to postmodernism the world is relativistic 
and it emphasizes relativism. And that is important because if you hold that kind of worldview, that everything is relative, that's going to have consequences to it. It always does. And postmodernism is not just some sort of odd intellectual ivory tower idea that professors kick around in the dusty corners of academics. It is the academic worldview. It is the worldview of intellectuals in Western culture. And everyone who's a teacher runs through that, that channel that is governed by people who believe that, courses that are taught by that. Everyone who goes to law school goes to institutions that are governed by that kind of a worldview, largely. But not for natural science. Postmodernism, postmodernism is the worldview for the arts, for the humanities, for the social sciences. Some call those the soft sciences, the not real sciences. I'm just kidding. <laughs> but there's one discipline in academics that has not grasped, has not embraced postmodernism, and that's natural science. If you're a physicist and you're building a bridge, you don't want a relativistic answer, do you? There is an answer to how much weight that bridge is going to be able to hold. If you're a chemist, there is an answer to how you mix things together before you help someone or kill someone. And if you're in medicine, there's a right answer to a problem, and then there can be many wrong answers to the problem. In the world of natural science, the world to which biology belongs, it is not relativistic or subjective. Reality tends to be objective. There is, there is an answer to that. You ask um, an, an astrophysicist, how do you get this object to orbit where you want it around our planet? Well, there is an answer to that, and it is objective. And they will tell you, this is what you do, and this will get it there. And if you don't do that, that's not going to work. Andrew mentioned in his, in his talk the other day the principle of fine-tuning in physics. I think it was, maybe it was Nathan. It was Nathan Ward who mentioned it. The principle of fine-tuning in physics. That the world simply seems where the, the laws of physics are so precise, it's like someone fine-tuned it. And that's a real principle in physics. They really talk that way. Because there's an answer to something. And if you get too relativistic in science, in natural science, well, people die when that happens. Natural science requires firm, clear, objective answers to work. And so in many ways, science, natural science, has come to be viewed as the one discipline that's objective, the one discipline that really emphasizes something absolute. There's an absolutism as opposed to a relativism, and I'm not sure that's a word, but I think that's a word, and I like it, so we're going to use it. And so there's a big contrast, a significant contrast, in the way the world is viewed by most of academia, which is very relativistic, and most of natural science, which is very absolute. And that absolute, oddly enough, takes the form of a very subjective belief, and that's materialism and naturalism. In the world of biology, that's it. You're not allowed to question that. It is an absolute position that the world is all there is. Nature is all there is. Physical material, that's what I mean by materialism here, not someone who wants stuff. Physical matter, material is all there is. And that's pretty well demanded if you're going to participate in biology. If you want to believe in God, that's fine, but you better keep it well away from your, from your biology world. So it's a discipline that claims to be absolute and views itself that way. I'll show that to you in just a moment. It views itself that way. Natural science tells you what's reality. But it's rooted in something that it can't be tested or proven. It is as much a belief as anything that nature is all there is. The biologist claims objectivity when the foundation for the whole discipline is something fundamentally subjective. Biology wears, biology wears clothes they don't know they are wearing. Let's begin illustrating this with... Uh, this chart from my professor, I've used this here before. Some of you may remember it from a few years ago, maybe not. 
uh, I took a course called Human History and Evolution. It was a great course, a great professor. She was very well, still is very well known in her field. She's no longer at University of Florida where I did this, took this course. She's up in New York, but very accomplished, written for magazines you know very well, led the American team that went to study King Tut's tomb. Huge name. First day of class, she said, this is science, what this class is. We deal with fact, empirical evidence, and continual testing. That's science. Belief deals with things like faith and doctrine. That was her illustration. And what she meant by that, and what she continued to emphasize, was this. Science tells you reality. We're going to talk about the way things really are. Whatever beliefs you hold, because doctrine, you've been told to believe it or else, or by faith, which he meant, you believe it because you just believe it. You notice faith is entirely separated from things like fact or evidence or testing. Well, that's things like superstition, things that are untestable, things that are authoritarian. That was the view. And so biology, like all the other natural sciences, accepts the view that it is a discipline with a foundation committed to fact, observation, continual testing. And that leads us to reality. I'll come back to this again in just a moment. i use it as an example to show, among many other things, that's how biology views itself. And this professor, by the way, was one of the best professors I ever had. She was an excellent teacher, and she and I had a couple of conversations in her office that were very good, very respectful, very pleasant together. So let's ask two questions. The first is going to be, is science really absolute and objective? The second is going to be, why do the other academic disciplines put up with science claiming to be absolute when they are so relative? And there's a reason for that. Why do they allow biology to get away with that? So first, is biology absolute? Is it truly objective, empirical, and factual? We'll start with this, looking at the same quote that Nathan read to us last Sunday. He closed with this quote. And the reason this quote is significant is the one who made it. It's about 20 years old now. I have a copy of where this came from in my bag in the back of the building. Uh, this is Professor Lewontin. He's a Harvard evolutionary biologist. He was writing a book review written by another evolutionary biologist. And this is in the middle of this rather long, lengthy book review that he wrote for this guy. Very, very well known name, Richard Lewontin. We take the side of science, in spite of the patent absurdity of some of its constructs, in spite of its failure to fulfill many of its extravagant promises of health and life, in spite of the tolerance of the scientific community for unsubstantiated just-so stories, because we have a prior commitment, a commitment to materialism. And that's, as you know by now, that's really where he's very, very honest. We have a commitment to something else, and the reason we stay with it is that we have a prior commitment we made before we ever ventured into the scientific enterprise, and that is materialism is it. That is reality. Now, this is important to understand. Materialism is a belief that material things, stuff, is all there is. Can you test? Can you test that? Is there any test we could do to see if there's something else other than material? There is not. We can't test the spiritual. We can't physically scope it. It doesn't show up on, as a blip on some kind of machine. That's not testable. But they made a commitment to it. If you don't know what a just-so story is, that language comes from a set of stories written by Rudyard Kipling, most famous for writing The Jungle Book. And there are a bunch of little children's stories, great stories, they're really fun to read. Where did the elephant get its trunk? Where did the leopard get its spots? Where did the armadillo get its shell? Those kinds of questions. And he tells these stories about how it happened. And they're fun. And they're full of fun words. And it's all, it's a story. It's far-fetched. Of course, it's not true. But it's a fun, entertaining story. And at the end, he says, and that's just so. That's, well, that's just how it happened. A crocodile jumped up, grabbed, it, grabbed an elephant's nose, and pulled on it. And the elephant pulled, and the nose stretched. And he pulled and pulled. And a, a snake comes in there at some point, And... By the end of the story, the elephant has a trunk, right? It's a story without a whole lot of corroborating evidence behind it. That's the image he uses to describe biology. 
in spite of unsubstantiated, just-so stories, we're committed to it. Because they're committed to a philosophy, something that is not objective. This quote continues. It is not that the methods and institutions of science somehow compel us to accept a material explanation of the phenomenal world, but on the contrary, that we are forced by our a priori adherence to material causes to create an apparatus of investigation and a set of concepts that produce material explanations, no matter how counterintuitive, no matter how mystifying to the uninitiated. Again, very honestly, he says, we have a commitment before we ever begin, a priori, before we ever begin, to material causes. And so we are going to give a material explanation, and we are going to insist, not that that's a philosophical result, a result of a philosophical position, that is reality, that is fact, empirical evidence, the result of continual testing. That's how we're going to present it. And in all, I think in all sincerity, most do. They do think of it that way. And to wrap this quote up, moreover, that materialism is absolute, for we cannot allow a divine foot in the door. The eminent Kant scholar Louis Beck used to say that anyone who could believe in God could believe in anything. To appeal to an omnipotent deity is to allow that at any moment the regularities of nature may be ruptured, that miracles may happen. You cannot allow the possibility that miracles happen. If miracles are intellectually allowed to happen, even just on the fringe of intellectual acceptance, and folks, a resurrection is possible. And suddenly, the Son of God becoming incarnate is intellectually acceptable. And you cannot have that. And I think that feeds into our second question. Why do the other disciplines put up with biology be, with not just biology, but the natural science being so absolute? Because if you're absolute, you keep God out the door in natural science. Richard Dawkins, another very famous evolutionist and evolutionary evangelist, many, many quotes, this is one of his, even if there were no actual evidence in favor of the Darwinian theory, there is, of course, we should still be justified in preferring it over all rival theories. Notice what he does in this. Evidence is irrelevant. It doesn't matter what the evidence is. If there were no evidence, Darwinism's the answer. And how can you say that? Because you've already made a philosophical decision before you start of where you have to end up. If materialism is true, the fact is something like Darwinism has to be true. There is no option for that. And he is, so he has removed evidence from even being an issue. Back to my professor's chart, just very briefly. I show this chart to students all the time. I showed it to the Teen One class just a couple of months ago. And I say, look, here's this chart. We, we're studying evidences. I say, what do you think about this? And as young as middle school, it doesn't take long for someone to look at that and think, it's not true that there's no facts in what you believe as a Christian. That's not true. And it's not true in science that you don't have faith in something. I can tell you this, I'm not being snarky by this at all, I'm just being as genuine as I can be. That human history and evolution course that I took, which was all about human evolution, is all those time life pictures. We should, Andrew showed us that picture, I think. <laughs> all those time, that was what that class was all about for a semester. And I left there really thinking that part of anthropology wasn't natural science at all. There was so little fact in it, and such incredible amounts of interpretation and faith in that. I wasn't being ugly about that, that's just really how it plays out. How can someone as bright and well-educated and I think well-intentioned, if I can read it right, believe that really science has this kind of separation from things like belief or doctrine and that belief has that kind of division from facts and testing and evidence? It's because the worldview from which you approach your discipline. That's where it comes from. I'd like to show a short clip. It's, the audio is, I think, good enough. 
There's a little bit of a buzz behind it. It's about a three, little over three-minute clip from Bill Nye the Science Guy. How many of you all grew up on Bill Nye the Science You know Bill Nye the Science Okay, you know Bill Nye the Science Guy. He's, this is an interview that he's doing, and he just talks a few minutes about sh should children be taught creation, is the idea. And this is just a clip of a longer, uh, a longer interview. There's a number of things he says that we could talk about, because he mentions all kinds of things. We can't talk about all of them, but I just want you to listen and observe what is his, what is his worldview. He's going to use the word worldview in there, in fact. What is his worldview, and how does it influence how he views this whole subject? All right, so we'll go ahead and play it, and hopefully this will be audible and clear. Denial of evolution is unique to the United States. I mean, we are the world's most advanced technological, so, I mean, you could say Japan. But generally, the United, United States, States is where, where most, most of the innovation, innovation still, still happens. happens. People, People still, still move to the United States. Uh, and that's largely because of the intellectual capital we have, the, the general understanding of science. When you have a portion of the population that doesn't believe in that, it holds everybody back, really. Evolution is the fundamental idea in all of life science, in all of biology. It's like, it's very much analogous to trying to do geology without believing in tectonic plates. You're just not going to get the right answer. Your whole world is just going to be a mystery instead of an exciting place. As my old professor Carl Sagan said, when you're in love, you want to tell the world. So once in a while, I get people that really, that, or that claim they don't believe in evolution. And my response generally is, well, why not? Really, why not? Your world just becomes fantastically complicated when you don't believe in evolution. I mean, here are these ancient dinosaur bones or fossils. Here is um, radioactivity. Here are distant stars that are just like the, our star, but that are a different point in their life cycle. The idea of deep time of this of billions of years uh, explains so much of the world around us. If you try to ignore that, your, your worldview just becomes crazy. It just uh, untenable, itself inconsistent. And I say to the grown-ups, if you want to deny evolution and live in your, in your uh, world that's completely inconsistent with everything we observe in the universe, that's fine. But don't make your kids do it, because we need them. We need scientifically literate voters and taxpayers for the future. We need people that can, uh, we need engineers that can build stuff, solve problems. These are, it's just really hard. Right, that's thing. good. It's, it's really a hard thing. You know, in another couple of cents, response generally is, well, why not? So he ends that, um, that little clip, uh, saying that um, he's sure in 100 years the whole idea of creation won't even won't exist because there's just no evidence for it, as he puts it. There's just no evidence for that worldview. So there's a couple of things he says in there that I just want to point out to you about it. Um, miss may miss a little bit at the beginning. He said, at the very beginning, he's, he makes this sort of three points. The United States leads the world in technological innovation. That's what he says. If you don't believe evolution, uh, we also, I was getting to point three. Point one, we, the United States leads the world in innovation. Point two, we are the only country in the world that denies evolution. Those are the first two points. You would think point three might be something like denial of evolution doesn't hold you back. <laughs> but his third point was denial of evolution holds everything back. Well, that doesn't even make sense. <laughs> and it's objectively not true. You see him struggling to say things like, okay, every once in a while I hear somebody tell me they don't believe in evolution. Well, they claim they don't believe in evolution. It's almost as though he can't believe people don't believe it. Why does he find it so difficult to understand there's a different point of view? It gets back to his worldview. And he makes some claims about time and tectonic plates and all that stuff, and we don't have time to get into all those kinds of, kinds of matters. But you can see him wrestling with this, and even his mannerisms and his eye roll. You parents, whatever you want to think, it's like he, he just thinks you're crazy. 
Well, folks, I'm not, a, I'm not a general evolutionist, but I understand where they're coming from. I understand why an evolutionist gets to that point. They're very misguided, but I know where they're coming from. I know where a Calvinist comes from, and I don't think they're crazy because they're a Calvinist. Your worldview is so potent. It's potent for all of us. What you see this in biology is this idea that, man, we have reality. And there is one reality. You notice that in this video, right? There is a reality, and that's it. More we can say, but for time's sake, we'll have to stop. Biologists walk around thinking, and I think, well, they do. They walk around thinking they wear the comfortable clothes of fact, empirical evidence, and testing. They tell each other that, and others affirm it in many ways. The reality is you don't have to look very close at biology before you see they garb themselves in belief, in subjective philosophy, and in untestable worldviews. Very old clothes indeed, but they don't know they wear them. One more evidence of this, the next generation science standards. These are now a few years old, but I think they're still the same things. This is maybe two years ago. In teaching biology to secondary students, communicate scientific, scientific information that common ancestry and biological evolution are supported by multiple lines of empirical evidence. That's the only view you're allowed to teach. That's it. Because that's reality. There's no relativism in that. That is it. So why do academics allow that? You don't have that kind of absolutism in literature, for sure. Not in psychology or sociology, or history, or library science, maybe, I don't know. <laughs> I looked at John, maybe, I don't know. <laughs> Whatever they do, why do they allow it in the natural sciences, in academia? Philip Johnson, who was an attorney, he passed away a couple of years ago, wrote a book called Reason in the Balance in 95 or 96. It's a little bit of an older book now, but he devotes a chapter largely devoted to this question. Why is this allowed? And his conclusion, I think he's right, at least partly. It makes sense to me. The absolutism in science is the foundation for the relativism in every other discipline. And that's for relativism in morality and ethics and justice and fairness and economics and everything else. This is a quote from Johnson in that book. Naturalism in science, should be in science, provides the foundation for liberal rationalism in morals by keeping the possibility of divine authority effectively out of the picture. That's exactly what Luantan said it does for biology. Johnson takes that idea and applies it to every other discipline in academia. We keep God out of the door and now everything can become relativistic because there's absolutely no reason to put a standard on anything. You can't. Continues, belief in naturalistic evolution is foundational to a great deal else. It's more than biology. And so it could hardly be presented as open to doubt. The schools accordingly teach that humans discover the prof dis emphasize this, <laughs> that humans discover the profound truth of evolution, but humans invent moral standards and they can change them as human needs change. And I think he's exactly right. Why do the psychologists and the sociologists allow biology to say, this is it, and you don't question it, we're going to kick you out of the department. We will not publish you. Because it's the foundation for all of their relativism. Much more is at stake when you're talking about general evolution than was Darwin right? Or is biology right? It has the potential to undermine the philosophical foundation of what has become the philosophical foundation of Western culture academia and Western culture intellectualism. And you attack the foundation of anything, and you're going to get a pretty strong reaction to that. That's the biologist's close. A philosophical position that is untestable, unempirical, unempirical, subjective. So what now? What do we do? Just a couple of thoughts before we close. The whole idea of the emperor's new clothes, which is where, of course, the title comes from. You know that story, perhaps. The emperor who paid these 
weavers, tremendous sums of money to make him a beautiful new cloth, and they worked, and they worked, and his, his, uh, his employees, whatever, I can't think of them, his subjects would go and watch them work, but there's no, there no material being seen, and that's because only the most brilliant person could see it. If you weren't worthy, you couldn't see the cloth that they were making. At the end of the day, he parades down the street, naked, wearing his new clothes, because he's too ashamed to say, maybe he's too dumb to see it. You know, until finally some little kid calls out, the emperor's naked! And then everybody realizes, okay, I thought so. <laughs> I thought he was. So what do we do? It's all about self-deception. That is, I am deceived about myself. That's what this whole thing gets, gets back to. And I'm as prone to that as anybody. Not because I'm a biologist, because I'm a human being. I am prone to that, and so are you. So a couple things to, to, to take before we leave. One is to recognize the clothes that biology and all natural science wears. And when information is presented as fact, as absolutely certain, and you can't question it, question it. Question everything. That's just the position we're in. And then be alert to the influence of any worldview, of any idea. It doesn't have to be Gnosticism or postmodernism to lead me to a place I really don't need to go. The fact is, any of us can meet the, meet, miss the obvious significance to things because of a certain view we hold. Jesus sort of addresses this idea in Luke chapter 12. If you turn there with me really quick, let's read a couple of verses. Luke chapter 12, and we'll read verse 54. Luke chapter 12 and verse 54. And this is how Jesus describes this. <clears throat> then he also said to the multitudes, whenever you see a cloud rising out of the west, immediately you say, a shower is coming. And so it is. And when you see the south wind blow, you say, there'll be hot weather. And there is. Hypocrites, you can discern the face of the sky and of the earth. How is it you cannot discern this time? He says, look, you look at the weather and you can pay attention to what's going on, put two and two together and draw a conclusion. And you, you know what to expect. The problem is, Jesus says, I'm right here. And the evidence is all over the place for you to see. And you can't see it. Why did they miss it? Something so obvious. You can't discern the time you're living in. It's a time unlike any other. Do you, know, you don't know who's talking to you. Because they had views that clouded them. It wasn't because the message was too fuzzy and obscure. It wasn't because Jesus didn't do a good enough job explaining who he was or demonstrating who he was. It's because they had a worldview in their mind that prohibit, prohibited them from seeing the truth before them. And Jesus called them out on it. And that's what was going on. Turn with me to John chapter 8. And he does the same thing. John chapter 8 is part of a conversation that goes back a couple of chapters between Jesus and both his, his disciples, those who believed in him and those who didn't. And here near the end of chapter 8, let's read verse 43. He's been challenged, and challenged pretty strongly. In fact, in chapter 8, it's pretty tense in the kind of discourse back and forth. And this is what he finally says in verse 43. Why do you not understand my speech? Because you are not able to listen to my word. You are of your father, the devil, and the desires of your father you want to do. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own resources, for he is a liar and the father of it. But because I tell the truth, you do not believe me. Which of you convicts me of sin? And if I tell the truth, why do you not believe me? He who is of God hears God's words. Therefore you do not hear, because you are not of God. It's the same point. They don't believe, their struggle with belief is not because Jesus was just not clear in his teaching or didn't give the right kind of illustration or piece together the right Old Testament scriptures to make the point just really jump out to them. 
it's because their mind had been led a place by, well, who Jesus says, the devil. And so when they're presented with the truth from the Father, they think that's the deception. Instead of what they're following being the deception. It gets back to their worldview. My worldview powerfully changes, powerfully affects how I interpret the world around me. You know 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 33 probably. Evil company corrupts good habits or good morals. Paul is not really talking about your friends. That's a great principle for picking your friends or picking a spouse. But that's not who he's talking about in 1 Corinthians 15. He's talking about people who carry with them an idea, a thought. And what he's saying is, be careful what thoughts you keep company. Because what you think is what you do. That's 1 John. If you believe Gnosticism, you're going to live it. If you believe there's no resurrection, 1 Corinthians 15, then you're going to end up living like there's no resurrection. And Christianity is a ri ridiculous if there's no resurrection. And you're going to walk away from it in a very violent way if you really believe there's no resurrection. Evil com company is your idea. What thoughts are you thinking? And he doesn't teach us to be afraid of new ideas or to run from new ideas. He teaches us to be discerning of new ideas and to not allow the enemy, the father of lie, to bring us into the deception that John speaks of in 1 John chapter 1. Because he will. And when he does, that's where my behavior goes. And so to close, let's go to 1 John one more time. 1 John chapter 4 and verse 1. He does not say run away from every idea, or to use the word here, every spirit. 1 John chapter 4 and verse 1, he admonishes us to do this. Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits whether they are of God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. Listen and learn. We all have much to learn. And I could be deceived today and need to have that cleared up. So he says, test the spirits, and then with discernment, God will lead you to where you're supposed to be and to where you're supposed to go. Biology is a... It's not everybody's favorite, <laughs> but it's influenced our world tremendously. There may, be, there may be no idea that has more powerfully affected Western culture in the last 150 years than Darwinism. It's in everything. It had a tremendous influence in the 20th century on the way the world was shaped. You and I live in that world. We don't need to be run from it. We're raising kids in that world. We don't need to be scared of it. But we need to be aware of what truth is and what those kinds of worldviews will do for us. I'll close in 30 seconds. Just show you this. I've shown you this before, but it's been a few years. If you haven't seen it, it's one of my favorite activities I do every semester, almost. I, tell, I just did it in Teen 1 and Teen 3 this semester. Ask your, ask your student about it. If you have your kid as your student, your child about that, if you have one in there. I tell them, look, these are footprints in the snow. Make an observation and then make an inference. And the first thing most people do is mix up the difference in observing something, which is a fact, and inferring something, which is a conclusion. And you can, we run them through this whole idea. And so they may come up with things like, here's some observations. There's two animals. They come from directions. There's size. There's spacing. Those kinds of things. And they come up with all kinds of conclusions about this or inferences about it. There's one animal's bigger, a large animal runs, or maybe he's stepping over something. The small animal, almost always the first thing, the small animal was lunch. It got devoured. Maybe it jumped on top of the large animal. Maybe it flew away. All kinds of inferences in that. My favorite moment in this exercise is nearly every time after we do this, everyone participating has made an assumption that I didn't say was true. Almost every time they do it. Evan Anchez ruined it for me this last time almost. <laughs> he was the first person, I think four years, to at the very beginning figure something out that most people don't. That assumption is people tend to think the footprints were made at the same time. And when you make that assumption, and it's the natural place to begin. It's just where we mentally begin. 
And if I give them long enough time, somebody always figures that out. Like, wait a minute, this, what if these weren't made at the same time? Here's the point. We make about assumptions about things all the time. And our assumption influences the conclusions we draw from fact, or what we observe. And sometimes we don't even know we're making the assumption. And we eliminate entire possible, reasonable explanations for things from the very beginning. That's what Darwinism does. That's what materialism does. When you make an a priori commitment to a philosophical view, at the very beginning you eliminate entire expl uh, good explanations and inferences of things, and you set yourself up for deception. That's the world we live in. We know it, and we're not ignorant of Satan's devices, so we can step into it with confidence. Let's say a prayer together, and then we'll be dismissed. Our Father, we are so grateful for your truth. It is rich. It is light. It gives us stability in a world that is everything but stable. And that you have blessed us with a blessing to know it until we've been taught it. We offer our deepest gratitude and thanks. We also know our own frailty. That our enemy is cunning. That he is the father of deception. And everyone here has been deceived by him and fallen to it. We pray for discernment. That you and your providence will protect us where we are weak. And bring other people and other influences into our life that can help hone us and grow us. And may we be lights in a world. People who look the world around them and realize there's, it's dark. And there must be something better and different. And whose hearts are open and ready to hear who Jesus is. We pray you use us this week to open doors for those people to come here. To worship with us and to study with us. In Jesus' name, amen.